Hello, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming to this Teradadu guest talk from Anjali Bansal from Ivana Capital. It's great to see so many familiar faces here today. Thanks for joining us. It's also great to see some faces that I don't recognize. Thanks also to you. Welcome to any of you joining from outside of the Teradadu community. My name is Greg Findlay. I am director of Teradadu's 12 week flagship course, Climate Change Learning for Action. And our talk today is the keynote for the fellows in our newly launched Axolotls cohort of Learning for Action. It's also one of the expert guest talks for the fellows in our ongoing Zebras cohort. These two cohorts together represent around 350 fellows from more than 30 countries, and they come from a broad range of professional backgrounds. They're teachers, entrepreneurs, software engineers, project managers, uh, oil and gas workers transitioning out of the oil and gas industry, bankers, farmers, activists, scientists, parents, but all of them are here looking for how they can get involved in addressing climate change. The Learning for Action course is an intensive exploration of climate science, climate impacts, and climate solutions. And it is a combination of written classes, live weekly lab sessions, deep dives, and expert guest talks like this one. Teradadu was founded in 2020 with an ambitious goal of getting 100 million people working on climate change in this decade. To achieve this goal, we offer a combination of climate education, connections to employers and climate jobs, and a supportive community of people who want to make a difference on climate change. If you're not familiar with Teradadu, you can check out our programs at Teradadu on the web, and you can download our mobile app available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. We offer a new cohort of Learning for Action starting every six weeks. And if you're interested, we urge you to check it out on the web and, uh, and learn how you can become involved in addressing climate change. Our next cohort begins on May 1st. Before we get started with our talk today, I want to cover a few points about the Zoom session. I think everyone's doing this, but please mute yourself so we can all hear our speaker. Following the talk, we should have some time for questions and answers but we're taking questions from our current fellows uh, using Slido. And fellows, you can find the link to Slido in Slack in the post announcing this event today. And with that, I would like to pass the mic over to Kamal Kapadia, co-founder of Terra.do and the creator of the Learning for Action course, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Greg. And on behalf of the entire Terra community, I am delighted and honored to welcome Anjali Bansal and to invite her to give this keynote address. Anjali, I think I've never really expressed to you the deep admiration and gratitude I hold for you. And I'm gonna use this opportunity to share with our entire community, not only how much you mean to Tara, but also how much you mean to me personally. And this is before we even get to your incredible accomplishments, which I will also share before handing the mic over to you. Anjali's company, Avana Capital and Sustainability Fund, and Anjali herself have been amongst the earliest believers and supporters of Terra. Avana is Terra's lead investor, and from our very earliest days, Anjali and her entire team have provided invaluable support and strate strategic guidance. And this is over and beyond what the very significant capital infusion itself has enabled us to do and accomplish. I can never overstate my gratitude for this, Anjali. All of us at Terra are deeply thankful. I want to also share how in so many ways you are an incredible role model for me. There are not many women leaders in the climate space and even fewer from the global south. And there is so much I admire about how you navigate and accomplish this work in what is still a male dominated environment. You are fundamentally a systems thinker, which is so essential to solving climate change. You are incredibly practical and very astute in business strategy. And you are also deeply philosophical with a strong moral compass. You have no tolerance for greenwashing and fake solutions. And also you've helped me see how actually getting things done in the real world involves compromise at times. So it's even more important to know what your values are and stay true to them. And most importantly, while you are a global citizen and global minded in so many ways, your deep love for and incredible work in India is truly inspiring. Your contribution to driving climate innovation in India across so many spaces, policy, business, finance, philanthropy is just tremendous. 
You always, always remind me and us at Terra why doing this work in India matters so much. And you show us how it can be done. And you remind me not to forget my roots. You know that development and justice and climate are fundamentally connected. And I hope you'll be happy to know that this ethos is embodied in the Learning for Action program. So this is just my personal intro and we haven't even gotten to your bio yet, which I will now share. And maybe we can get Anjali's deck loaded up in the meanwhile. Um, so Anjali, as I mentioned, is the founding partner of Avana Capital and Sustainability Fund, investing in technology and innovation led startups, um, catalyzing climate solutions and sustainability. Previously, Anjali was the non-executive chairperson of Dena Bank, appointed by the government of India to steer the stressed bank's resolution and merger with Bank of Baroda. Prior to that, Anjali was a global partner and managing director with TPG Growth PE, responsible for India, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Middle East. She was also a strategy consultant with McKinsey and Company in New York. Anjali has invested in various successful startups, including Nika, Delivery, Urban Company, Darwin Box, Farm Mart, and climate tech startups like Turno and Eki. She serves as an independent director on leading board, boards, including Tata Power, Nestle, and Piramal Enterprises. These are all huge companies in India. She has been appointed on the board of ONDC, Open Network for Dis Digital Commerce, and Gift City, and chairs the Climate Council within IVCA. She is a member of the Evolution Review Committee for Niti Aayog, India's premier policy think tank chaired by the Indian Prime Minister. Anjali has also previously chaired the India Board of Women's World Banking and serves on the boards of GSK, GSK Pharma, Siemens and Bata. Thank you so much for being here, Anjali, and over to you. Kamal, let me start first by saying thank you so much. I'm so touched. Uh, by your introduction and uh, you know the Terra community, the Terra family, and you and Anshuman, Bayankar, all so very special to us. Um, I am inspired every day by the work you do, and uh, just seeing this group here, I think is a and I had booted up the deck, but let me just put the screen on again. The tremendous diversity I see here, here along with some uh, old friends and known names, uh, is wonderful. And it just again underscores that it takes a community to make real change happen. And it requires the full spectrum of opinions, uh, thought process, action. And I love the learning for action by itself says so much, right? It's not enough to learn. You have to learn and you have to do. And so when we first met and I learned a little bit about Terra.do, the dot do is so important. So on that note, and once again, thanking all of you for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, I will flip through a few slides, but let's keep it interactive. It's a conversation and I'd love to learn a little bit as well from how all of you think about uh, contributing to climate action. There's a global north, there's a global south. Uh, they don't always speak the same language. I think groups like this and one of Terra.do's missions actually is to act as this uh, global bridge, if you will, and get us all on the same path. So on that note, so today's session really focuses on why to invest in climate. The so climate work, by the way, can be anybody. And what I tell all my companies, big companies, small companies, is everyone can be a climate worker. You can be, uh, involved in sustainability work in a steel company, very hard to abate sector, and still be a climate worker because you're making a difference. You can be in a climate tech startup or building deep, big data models for climate change. And that is also climate work. We at Avana have chosen the path of investing and demonstrating that you create two types of value when you invest in good companies, working for climate action. There is value creation. So capital plays an important role. Capital has to earn a return. So there is value creation. But you're also making change happen and positive change. And that's the other kind of value creation. So the, there is a tremendous opportunity in the world today to drive value creation of different types through climate investing. We at Havana think about climate. And again, for all of you, you're all deep in this space, this is not a new framework, but I'm just using this as a way to remind ourselves 
what is the path to net zero? We think about the path to net zero as mitigation, adaptation, resilience. The global north, for the most part, talks a lot more about emissions, global warming, carbon, greenhouse gas, afforestation, increasing green cover, and so on and so forth. But the global south, which is where a lot of the world's population lives, and it is still on an economic growth journey, we have no option but to think about adaptation, which is creating the transition pathways to go from high carbon to low carbon while maintaining economic growth. And then very importantly, there is resilience building. So some of the most vulnerable parts of uh, the global population live in the global south. So how do you climate proof the economic and social systems? And uh, again, I think there's a lot of discourse around JETP, the just energy transition or the just and equitable transition principles. So who defines what is just? Who defines what is equitable? And of course, the transition needs to take place. And we deeply believe at Avana that tech-led innovations can actually drive positive outcome for people, profits, and planet. You don't have to actually have a trade-off. You don't need to trade off people and planet. It's not in opposition. It should be in synergy, in harmony. And what is good for profits and people should also be good for planet. And that happens when you find new technologies. So why India, why climate, why now? Uh, why climate, why now? I know I'm preaching to the choir, but in some ways for those of us who have been around for a while, sustainability feels today like the next digital. So 25 years ago, most companies did not have a CTO. Other than in the Bay Area and the Valley, tech companies had CTOs, but you know, consumer company didn't have CTO or a big bank might have had a department. Today, digitalization is embedded across the enterprise. For us to achieve globally, and remember friends, Climate is a global problem. It cannot be solved in isolation. No country, no continent, no nation state can solve air, water, weather on their own. We all have to act in concert globally. And consequently, climate and sustainability action has to get embedded across large enterprises for real change to take place. And so today it really feels like what digital and technology were in say the early 2000s and the late 1990s, that's where we are sitting. Big problem area, big opportunity area. I mentioned already that India and the global south have to balance people, profits, and planet. We will not be able to achieve our planetary climatic goals if we are not also able to create the pathways, the lower carbon pathways for economic growth. And consequently, large companies will all need technolo technology and innovation, and that does not necessarily come from large companies, as you know, and that's the role of the innovation ecosystem and startups. India is very uniquely positioned. We are the largest population in the world, the largest young population, fifth largest economy, the fastest growing large economy, soon to be the third largest economy, third largest emitter. So consequently, while it's a locus of a problem, if you will, but we also have very technically qualified talent, the third largest startup ecosystem, we have a track record of creating technolo uh, technological leapfrogs. So we leapfrogged, uh, for those of you who are Indian, you will remember this, we leapfrogged the whole fixed line telephony into going into 5G. We have the lowest cost data network in the world today. We have a billion people with digitized bank accounts, a billion point four people with unique digital IDs. So consequently, if we can leapfrog on technology and digitization, we can also leapfrog on climate. And whatever problem you solve for 1.4 billion people, which are in a very, very cost conscious um, market uh, through frugal innovation, those solutions can be built not just for India, but also for the world. So that trends is why we at Avana do what we do and why we, we believe there is a very big opportunity in investing behind climate. So why is now a good time? Now is a good time because if you put all the three pieces together, you have technology, you have markets. Markets need to adopt technology for climate action, which is typically large companies, at least for now. And you have policy. So these three actors play a big role. And then, of course, there is capital. Today, declining technology cost curves actually have enabled the scale up of green alternatives, not for the sake of green, but because it just makes more business sense. Renewable energy today costs less. A new unit of solar costs less than a new unit of thermal. You add storage to it, and in, depending on geographies, for example, in India and Northern Europe and Scandinavia, you can actually do pumped hydro as storage, which is actually fairly environmentally friendly, at least compared to the alternatives. 
you suddenly end up with a much lower per unit cost, grid, st- grid scale cost of renewable energy. Battery prices have fallen 88% over the last decade. And again, digital penetration and the penetration of internet is helping us to digitize and decarbonize supply chains, agriculture, and payments. So consequently, we are sitting at, a, at actually a very opportune time right now, where we have a large technology-enabled population, tremendous will from markets, as well as technology that is now cost-effective and available. In India particularly, we are supported by what we call the five Cs. Capital I have talked about, globally capital is going into ESG or responsible businesses. Consumers prefer sustainable alternatives as long as they are at least cost neutral for them. They're not more expensive. We spoke about technology already. Then there is competency. So at Avana, we are seeing about 200 new opportunities every quarter. So that's the kind of entrepreneurial energy, competency, talent that is going in. So many of you, I'm sure from this, from the various Terra cohorts will go out and then start new businesses, hopefully. And very importantly, policy. So policy is a big actor. It's an enabler, can be a blocker. You're seeing in the US, the IRA is a big enabler. In India, we have the Panchamrit approach uh, coming out of the COP. And uh, we know that climate action is one of the top five agendas, not just for the prime minister, but in fact, for the entire policy administration in India as well. So conducive policy, strong tailwinds. Again, these five forces coming together make it a very opportune time. So we are seeing a lot of activity. Um, Last year in 2022, climate tech startups raised more money than in any previous years. In fact, I think in the last few years, cumulative. And earlier, while most of the investment was going into utility scale, say solar or hydro or wind, and mostly on the energy side, we are now starting to see a lot more activity and capital flowing into mobility, for example, electric mobility. Um, just going back, we need India needs about $10 trillion of climate finance to achieve our net zero goals by 2070. Globally, the number is anywhere you hear, anywhere from $43 trillion to about $200 trillion over the next uh, 20, 30 years. And so, again, capital will play a very big role, but it has to be matched by solutioning that then comes from the startup innovation ecosystems and from a lot of committed climate workers like many of you on the call today. What do we do at Avana? So as we started thinking about where can we make the most difference, uh, we have taken three sectors. And three, uh, so climate really is a theme for us. Climate by itself is not a sector. Um, we have taken three sectors that constitute 90% of the emission footprint. So very large problem area, but it's also 70% of the economy. So it's a large market area. So consequently, we are able to find and invest in market ready business solutions that can be commercialized at scale and hence create large value outcomes as well. Uh, These three sectors, verticals, if you will, are energy and resource management. So energy transition, it's 40% of India's emissions, 60% of our energy is still non-renewable. Mobility and supply chains. So the entire gamut of electric mobility and alternative mobility solutions. Supply chains is low hanging fruit. Uh, we have one of the more fragmented, less efficient supply chain systems. So whenever you digitize you and you create efficiencies, that's also leading to decarbonization uh, and hence value creation and then sustainable agriculture and food systems. So think about it as sort of energy security, food security and market linkages. All of these issues, energy security, food security are critical to any country. You have been for those of you in the Bay Area, you've been dealing with unseasonal heavy rain. I believe there was a power outage yesterday and perhaps earlier in the week as well. And, you know, it's the kind of stuff that we used to think about in developing countries and now it's having happening in developed countries. So unseasonal rain, unseasonal heat leads to interruptions and disruptions in the food supply chain. Food supply chain is not just a matter of business and uh, commercial impact, but is very profound where at least in the global south, in India, for example, 50% of our economy is still linked to agriculture. So whenever there is a failure, crop failure, or destruction of crop, it's not just loss of food, it's also loss of livelihood. And that goes back to building resilience. And so we invest in technology-led solutions. And of course, you can never separate out water when you're talking about energy or agriculture. Water is fairly integral to it. And it has been said, yes, of course, data is the next oil, but the next set of wars could well be fought on water. So this is what we invest in. 
uh, some of the our companies, and you will see Terra.do here occupying pride of place. We are very, very proud. We feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to partner with Kamal and Anshuman Mank and the entire Terra.dot team uh, right from the start. Big believers. Uh, I'm going to pause for a minute and check in with Greg. Should we continue talking a little bit more about some of the companies we have invested in, the kind of opportunities we are seeing, or would you want me to start taking questions? Um, first, I'd love to call out a couple of people have commented. There's a little bit of background noise where you are, Anjali. So is it? Um, I'm in a room by myself, actually. So okay. So yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's see if this is better. Is this better? Uh, I think so. Yeah, it was someone commented it might be just something rubbing on a table or a microphone or something. But uh, it's probably okay. Tell me if this is better. That sounds great. Okay. Thank you so very much. Yes, so, sounds awesome. Um, yeah, if you uh, please feel free to speak about what you would like. If you'd like to talk about some of the investments, and really, I think it's very important and helpful for us to hear about the different opportunities and mm -hmm. and needs that you're seeing. So that okay. would be great. So let me then bring alive some of the sectors I spoke about. Um, we have in the past invested in companies like Terno. Terra, of course, all of you know, so I will not go into detail there. But Terno is building out uh, an EV transition enablement platform for small commercial vehicle operators. And this is a very unique space because this is your one ton, two ton electric vehicle. It's not a private passenger vehicle. It's a freight vehicle. It's the backbone of intracity trade typically operated by also small business owners. So the transporters that run these vehicles are themselves SMB, small businesses, and do not really have much access to credit. So in some ways, Turno is addressing carbon mitigation because it's electric. It's also create, lowering the total cost of ownership and enabling adoption, so helping transition and building resilience and livelihood protection for small business owners. So we are, uh, we are early investors in Turno. Turno is growing very rapidly, already become the largest sort of distribution channel for some of the electric OEMs. Uh, Farmart is working in the agri-market linkage, um, helping connect farmers from the farm gate to large-scale procurement of staples. And because of their technology and their SaaS-based platform, uh, micro SaaS-based platform, they also have a lot of agility. So they are able to help farmers improve their income as much as 20% and thus creating again resilience and decarbonization in the supply chain. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Iki Foods. Iki is revolutionizing how food is grown. So if you think what assembly line did to manufacturing, Iki is actually doing to production of vegetables. So they have a patented material science based, polymer based growing chamber technology and a growing environment technology where they are able to grow everyday vegetables, which are otherwise quite not climate resilient, like tomato, eggplant, green chilies, which are staple everyday vegetables in India, grow them with 80% less water consumption, very minimal electricity usage because they don't use a greenhouse, and 300% more yield per acre. And so year in, it, it's, it's, it's uh, not vulnerable to seasonal variations, not vulnerable to climate, they're able to grow tomatoes at sort of 50 degrees Celsius ambient temperature in the desert of Rajasthan. And if they can grow it in Rajasthan, in the desert for those who are familiar with Kota, uh, they can grow it anywhere. So they're actually getting interest now from uh, the GCC, the Middle East, to bring some of their farms into the Middle East as well. I can go on and on. Some of, some of our companies are super exciting. And I'm sure once we get into conversation, perhaps some of you will have more examples as well. Uh, Aram is our latest, most recent investment and in building out a full stack platform for enablement of rooftop solar. So India has a 40 gigawatt rooftop solar mission and over the next uh, few years. And uh, a lot of it is being run by large power companies, the utility scale solar. But for rooftop solar, again, the rooftops for MSMEs, the installers are again, fragmented, relatively low on tech adoption type micro entrepreneurs. So Aram is enabling them for helping expand rooftop solar capacity, installation, procurement, and eventually better income generation as well. We are very happy to share. We're a relatively young firm, old people, but young firm. And in a relatively short time, we've uh, 
very, very, very happy that we've been able to produce some outcomes and good uh, climate impact. We are uh, we think about impact in three ways: uh, environment, economic, and social. We are today empowering about 3 million plus smallholder farmers. We are reaching more than 200,000 MSMEs. And uh, of this, I'm particularly proud about 300,000 women beneficiaries through our companies. 40% of our portfolio is either female founder or co-founder led. 65% uh, of our portfolio operations are not in metros, but they are in tier three in rural India, creating 10,000 plus jobs and have uh, created more than 100 million in income enhancement over the last three years. And then, of course, we have a large set of environmental indicators as well. So, friends, that's where we are. And by the way, along with this, we are generating good financial returns as well. Because uh, returns, financial returns are important. Profits are good. Profits help to continue expanding businesses. And when you grow and expand and scale commercially, it makes that whole cycle become a virtuous cycle and you can create more climate action. In addition, we are uh, very cognizant that as a pioneering fund in climate tech, we are the first and first of our kind in India, climate tech. We are also creating an ecosystem. So there's a lot of market education. We have started, uh, we have been doing a monthly newsletter. We have started doing in climate, in-person climate mixers and very encouraged by the response to it. Let's talk climate. We did one in Mumbai, in Bangalore, in Delhi. We've had more than 400 attendees and this is, it's it's there's no there are no it's not a session like this there are no speeches there are no presentations it's very peer to peer uh, it's funders founders academics researchers industry people all coming together and over beer and pizza so very informal and more than 400 people have actually attended our climate mixers we write a lot we do a lot of podcasts uh, we had anshuman on our fireside chat series uh, two weeks ago and uh, and we're also planning large convening events along with partners like a G app or a, you know RMI and hopefully with Terra as well. This is the team. Um, Kamal's al already shared some of my background. Very proud to share uh, my partner Swapna. Swapna has spent several years doing uh, deep tech investing, leading Qualcomm Ventures investments here in India. Shruti has uh, again many of us are engineers, by the way. So Shruti started her career after IIT with IFC and has been working in the investment and ESG space for a long time. And we take uh, building capacity in our companies very seriously. So Rahul, who is not just our chief financial officer for the fund, but also works closely with our portfolio to help scale up their financial management capacities. We are, again, very fortunate to have a very accomplished, but also deeply engaged and committed, passionate board of advisors. Mr. Ramadurai is a legend. He is um, he was the ex-MD and CEO of Tata Consultancy Services, uh, Sandeep Singhal, who has created the largest uh, Indo-US cross-border technology investment platform called Nexus Venture Partners. He's an advisor. Sega Gebreyes, my Sega is my dear friend and a fellow previous partner at TPG. And uh, Sega does, an, does amazing work in Africa. She's one of the founders of Celtel along with Dr. Mo Ibrahim. Mr. Anami Roy, who's been a distinguished public servant and a, and a policy expert. And Mridula. Mridula is a fourth generation family entrepreneur, runs Sundaram Textiles, but is also the founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute and a phenomenal author on water and climate action. So that's who we are as Avana. Um, and I hope that this has given a little bit of a overview on why climate investment drives a lot of value and how it drives a lot of value and is also very fun. So I'm going to pause there, Greg. Yes, thank you so much, Anjali. Thanks for that. And we do have a number of, of questions. And so I think it'll be great to jump right into that. The, the, uh, one of the questions that's received the most upvotes, meaning lots of people want to hear this, is from Kate. And it says, as a job seeker, I want to make sure I'm talking to companies who are really focused on impact. What advice do you have for vetting companies on climate impact? As a job seeker, I think, uh, so I'm gonna go out on a little bit of a limb here. We think about climate impact only if a company is working, say, for example, in water conservation or renewable energy. What if you had the opportunity to work with a cement company or a steel company or a mining company and help them implement green in a, truly sincere and authentic way. I think that is as much climate impact 
Um, so today where we are in our economic growth model, in the post-industrial revolution economic growth model, it's fundamentally a high carbon model. So while those low carbon pathways are currently being defined, we are innovating and we are inventing new technologies, the reality is the world will continue to need more steel, more cement, more power. A lot of our power is still hydrocarbon based. You can't wish it away. So populations still need energy. So as a job seeker or somebody who's looking for a for the first start with being more broad minded and saying, how are you moving the needle? And it doesn't always have to be in a dare I say. in the climate or sustainability function. I know my sustainability team at Tata Power does phenomenal work. And I think they're making as much of a difference to the environment through our conservation programs, through our man mangrove uh, preservation programs, uh, working with local communities to build resilience, as is any climate tech startup. But I'd welcome a debate on this. Thank you. There's a, a number of people have wanted to hear about this. What uh, are your favorite climate-friendly exchange-traded funds? Could you share some on that? What are my favorite? So I actually do not have those. I'm not a ETF investor, so I actually don't have a view on that at all. I think we'll have to seek this from a public markets expert. That's fair enough, thanks. Yeah. Um, there's another question here that says corruption is an issue around the world. Uh, how do you address this in investing in companies in, in India? I would say the same way you would address it anywhere in the world. Uh, fortunately, um, with early stage companies, and we are early stage investors, we go in pre-Series A or Series A at most. Um, you're actually taking a bet on the entrepreneurs and their intent. So good governance and corruption is not as much about rules and regulations. It's actually about intent. And for the Hindi speakers on this group, I will say it is about niyat and not niti. Niti is rules, niyat is intention. So with large companies, it's easier to diligence almost, whether they have good governance practices uh, there are some obviously business environment issues. There are policy level issues and regulation. And some countries just offer you a more a, a, a sort of cleaner um, business environment. But at the company and the founder level is where really we have to apply judgment. We have to get to know the founders and know that they can be trusted to do the right thing. Times there'll be always will be difficult times. Large companies go through rough patches small companies go through even more rough patches i mean we are seeing this for over the last one year right you know the funding winter it's happened with bank failures in the us and and so on and so forth so it has really tested the resilience of uh, particularly entrepreneurs and i have a lot of respect and admiration for entrepreneurs because i think they really put themselves out there thank you we have a number of questions about the entrepreneurs um could you describe what is a typical persona uh, of someone that you might want to invest in? Uh, a follow up to that, what's the biggest blocker or challenge blocking progress from the Indian context? There is no typical per se persona. I think uh, founders are a subset of people. And if I, if I just look at the screen in front of me, there is no typical persona here that is uh, outwardly visible. I think what is uh, more similar is what's on the inside. And on the inside is a passion to make a difference, to solve a large problem. In our context, to use technology to solve a large problem and create a large outcome, uh, do it in an authentic, high integrity way. Do it in a way that is uh, fair, equitable, just to all your stakeholders, employees, shareholders, et cetera. So, in some ways, kind of that's the common persona, but that persona is not an externally visible persona. It's not about what's their ethnicity or country or background or educational qualification or age or gender. It's none of that. It's really what's on the inside. There are several questions following up on that. Um, how, how do you decide what technologies to fund or what startup 
what which entrepreneurs to fund. Could you walk us through that process a little bit? Sure. Uh, I think I have my colleague Riddhi also on this. And uh, Greg, Kamal, if you permit, and if Riddhi is there, then maybe Riddhi can chime in here as well. So we take a sure. full team approach. So Kamal, with your permission, and Greg, with your permission, I'm going to call sure, sure. Riddhi up. Because yes. at Avana, we take a full team approach. We, have, we say we play, a, it's like playing soccer. So you cannot play soccer on your own. You need a team. And yes, somebody has to shoot the goal, but the ball has to be moved across the field by passing it back and forth in a seamless collaborative fashion. So which technology to invest in? We do a lot of diligence. We have a very, very large, and we are very fortunate to have an extensive network of experts that we rely upon. And then of course, on the team also, we have a lot of expertise. But Riddhi, if I can turn to you. Yeah, um, I am here. Uh, not sure if I'm visible. Hello. We can um, hear you though. Okay. Uh, great. So, um, right, in terms of uh, thinking through our, um, you know, investment process, what company to invest in, I think the first and foremost filter, of course, um, you know, becomes climate impact. I think uh, as a team, we're very mindful about uh, climate impact. We stay true and honest to ourselves in terms of, um, you know, whether the solutions that we're looking at are actually going to be driving and moving the needle on social, economic and environmental outcomes. Um, I think that definitely becomes um, uh, the first le level of filtration. Um, the second level of filtration that because we are an early stage tech investor, we look at, um, you know, of course, whether uh, technology is what is solving the problem because uh, we fundamentally believe that technology is what is scalable technology is um, what can actually help um, create outsized incomes and um, you know you can actually uh, throw creative and intelligent solutions rather than throwing people or money at the problem um, so I think that would become the second uh, thing and I think the third thing is um, the founders itself I think we spend a lot of time speaking to founders and trying to um, gauge and understand, uh, of course, firstly on intent, as Anjali mentioned, and I think secondly on um, uh, whether they truly have, you know, the vision to build a large business and will be able to scale, uh, you know, the climate impact and not just maybe keep it constrained to uh, a small, um, a small outcome, but actually be able to create uh, businesses that can change the world. So I think that's that's a little bit about uh, how we think about investing. Riddhi is also a LFA alum, right, Riddhi? I am. I was part of the Tigers cohorts. And right. yeah, <laughs> Tara is, I think, obviously close to our heart at Havana. Um, It's actually a rite of passage for anyone at Havana. So <laughs> yeah. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. I was going to call that out as well. Um, thanks so much, Vidhi. Um, Palak asks a question on Slido, and I think a number of people who are not in the venture capital world kind of wonder about this. Is there a mismatch between venture capitalist expectations for large returns uh, within five to 10 years? And does this lead to under or over investing in certain sectors with regards to greenhouse gas impact? So there is a role for large generalist capital, but the, where we are in the cycle of climate evolution or climate technology and climate business evolution, there is, uh, I would think it is, we are at a time when we need more specialist capital here. Um, and we need it across the life journey of an enterprise. So we need the incubators, accelerators. We also need sometimes deep risk capital that comes from either granting or uh, R&D capital in labs. But when, as soon as it hits commercial capital, you need early stage, the seed, pre-series A, series A, we also need growth. And then we need the very large scale project finance type capital that goes into take new hydrogen development, right? You need a billion dollars of capex to actually do anything meaningful in hydrogen, but you can also do work on electrolyzers with a lot less capital, right? So you need specialist capital in our view. Um, but in addition to the specialist capital that can take a more informed point of view, there is a responsibility for all of us who are climate specialist investors to also crowd in more generalist capital because there's a lot more non-climate capital that's out there that will just come into a business because it's a good business regardless of whether it's climate or not 
So I see the I see a role for both, and a very important role for climate specialists, um, not just to make the early investments. Of course, they have to generate a return, but also to do evangelizing and crowd in your regular mainstream large money. Thanks. As a bit of a follow up to that, Tom asks, what happens when ideas, opportunities, technologies, mm -hmm. crucial from a mitigation adaptation perspective, cannot be made cost effective or profitable, at least now? And you talked about some of that, but would you go into that a bit more? So I think that's fundamental to venture risk. You're taking a call and there are tech investors who take tech risk and then there are investors who take more business model risk. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of the full stack of capital um, that will go in at different stages and take different kinds of risk. So, and by the way, that kind of capital is available, particularly around mitigation technologies. Uh, uh, there's a lot more capital available, say, in Northern America, uh, the US, Canada, North Europe, um, whereas in our part of the world, in the global south, to some extent, there's a there's a bit more focus on adaptation and resilience, and this is where development finance institutions, multilaterals, bilaterals, sovereigns, also play a big role. For them, population protection and financing a green and just transition is the here and now of supporting mitigation. Great. Uh, Manj asks, which carbon removal methods do you see that will have the best success in the near future? I wish I knew. <laughs> I think um, I think we have to see what actually works um, at commercial scale so that it is adopted across the board. And it is unlikely that it will be one or two, I hope that there are many that then become uh, useful in different contexts. Uh, take, for example, something as simple as flue gas capture is a decarbonization method, which is now not particularly high tech, not particularly expensive. And of course, there's a cost to it. Um, but when 60% of power is still coal based and you're still burning coal in power plants, then that is actually very important. Somebody has asked about sequestration and how is it solving for scope one, scope two, scope three. That's a, that, by the way, it's a great question. And I often think about offsets and say, is offset solving the problem? Is a carbon credit, carbon credits are great incentives, by the way. So let's not take that away from incentives. Uh, carrot works better than stick, as we know. But are offsets really solving the problem or just shifting the locus of responsibility in some ways? And I know Kamal, you and I have talked about this in the past as well. But I'll put my pragmatic hat on and say whatever it takes. So if right now it is taking offsets for people to change behavior and to allocate cost and transfer some capital, then so be it. Uh, but that is not really a solution. We have to find solutions that actually impact your scope one, scope two, scope three, and reduce carbon creation fundamentally, not just offsetting. What advice would you give to someone who is trying to get into impact investing? Um, start right away, but on a more serious note, Think about what role you can play. Um, impact investing, we are in, in sort of sort of version 3.0. So impact 1.0 was in the late, in the 90s, late 90s, and a lot of philanthropic capital was going into. So I've seen the early days of microfinance. Microfinance started as a developmental philanthropic activity to provide access, uh, economic, it actually didn't even start as women's economic empowerment. It, started as how to get credit to the poor and realizing that you are better off giving credit to poor women than poor men and the group lending models and so a lot of innovation took place and you don't think about it really but it was absolutely tremendously innovative so collateral free lending uh, using social capital as collateral doing group lending uh, doing doorstep banking you know and today we talk about doorstep banking that was the original doorstep banking and then microfinance went from being a developmental activity to being a mainstream high performing asset class regulated and large globally 
So that's the journey I'm seeing impact investing on. Impact 1.0 in the 90s, largely philanthropic. Impact 2.0, I, I want to say in the first decade of the, the century, um, again, philanthropic, developmental, concessional capital going into impact enterprises. And today, it's there is no trade-off. You don't have to trade off returns for creating impact. So do join the tribe that wants to both invest and create impact. Think about what your role is. It need not be a deal role. It can be a developmental role, but it can also be a deep tech role. So there are many ways to participate, many ways to contribute. Great, thanks. Ankush asks a great question here. If you had a magic wand, what problem would you love to see founders addressing now? Oh. So if I can say not one, but more than one. <laughs> I, uh, at least immediately number one would be grid scale storage. So the challenge with, the biggest challenge with large scale adoption of renewable is not generation capacity. There's, there's hydro, there's wind, there's lots of solar, and certainly in India has 300 days of solar. There's also nuclear, um, but keeping grid stability is the biggest challenge for switching to 100% renewable in most countries. So if we could magically tomorrow have a solution for stable grid scale, commercially viable storage. Two is plastics. So plastics, were this sort of miraculous chemical compound that got that was invented and various types of plastics helped us preserve food and transport and today it's kind of become one of the biggest problems to solve so inventions around uh, substituting plastics for more uh, whatever it is biodegradable and uh, alternative uh, chemistries and third is water water is where uh, you really, really see the divide between the haves and the have-nots. So in developed countries, I spend a lot of time in the US and uh, we take it for granted that you will get drinkable water out of the tap. Whereas in countries like India, many parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, water is a luxury. It's not something you take for granted and the poor pay a disproportionate amount of their consumption basket spend goes on water. Uh, failure of water, whether it's failure of monsoon, impacts agriculture, livelihood, and availability of food. And uh, our agricultural practices over the last, uh, sort of the post-war, post-Second World War, when the world was on the brink, of many, many parts of the world, we had famine. And so the highly chemical intensive, fertilizer intensive uh, agricultural practices to boost yields have led to depletion of soil and depletion of groundwater. So, those would be my top three. Grid scale storage is substitute for plastics, which is actually very, not just enough to substitute plastic, but what is viable, commercially scalable. And third is solving for water and the uh, disparity between the haves and the have nots. Regarding water, um, Manj asks, and a number of people have voted for this question. It's pretty specific, but it says, do you see Nestle transforming to a socially responsible organization enabling free clean water globally by partnering partnering with government funded water projects. If you know anything on that or thoughts. Um, so I think Nestle has actually got a massive commitment to sustainability. And I, when I talk about how enterprises embed sustainability across the value chain, and it's not a separate department, that's how Nestle, and I think a lot of very responsible good companies now think about sustainability, like they think about digital. You don't have a digital department. It's embedded across the entire value chain, and similarly, sustainability is embedded across the value chain. Uh, water is not any one company's issue that can be solved. It requires large government and societal action in concert. Um, it's unclear whether water can or should be free. There are different perspectives on this, so I will not put out sort of a point of view necessarily because I think it's a policy and, and it, it's different in different contexts. But just like people are used to paying for electricity, no one says there should be free power. Um, I think it's a question worth debating, should there be free water? 
And if so, who should it be free for and who should pay for it and how much? So what is the approach to water tariffing? So right now, by the way, the poor pay disproportionately more for water. For the rich, it's actually almost free. There's a somewhat of a related question here. What mechanisms are in place or are needed to ensure investments in energy security, food security, water security, supply chain connectivity, et cetera? Sorry, Greg, say again, what's the, the question again, please? What mechanisms are needed or in place to ensure investments uh, are integrated complementary in energy security, food security, water security, supply chain connectivity, et cetera? Right, so more funds like us, more dedicated capital like uh, Avana and others, and in the US you have uh, Breakthrough Energy, you have Congruent in Europe, you have 2150 and so on, Contrarian. So more committed capital that understands the interplay across these spaces. And like us, they are committed to solving for emissions. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, any climate strategy today is not say energy alone or agri alone. It has to be integrated across. So you have to think about emissions in an integrated way and the trade-offs that you make um, to make different models work. And it's not a one size fits all. It's different in different geographies, different in market conditions. Thanks. Um, there's some questions about, can you talk about non-financial KPIs, key performance indicators you look to define your success? Um, we look at, uh, I'm gonna try and get back to, there was a slide that we spoke about. Let's see if we can get there quickly. We look at environment, economic, and social. So on the environment side, of course, we look at uh, GHG emission reduction, water savings, onshoring of supply chains, which leads to decarbonization. But we also look at are we serving, how much are we actually able to access and empower underserved segments, defined as rural, so non-urban, uh, MSME, small businesses, farmers, and women and then uh, unlocking inclusive growth. So this goes back to what is just transition. And it's slightly controversial. So JetP is a little bit of a controversial um, framework right now, but at its heart, I think its heart is in the right place. So we have to think about how is growth going to be inclusive and sustainable? So that's what we look at. Thank you. And I, I know we've talked about this a bit, but this question is coming up again and again, so I'll just put it out again for you. What are some of the key differentiators your firm looks for when making a decision to pursue an investment in a company, if anything you have to add on that? Yeah. So four things, is this a large problem? So how big is the total addressable market? And so is it a big problem and consequently a big market? Is this a business model and a technology that we believe can actually solve that problem and create returns? Uh, third is, and actually this is probably the most important, is founder quality, uh, founder, founder team, their commitment, integrity, authenticity, and we, we take integrity very seriously um, on both intent and action. And can they actually do it? And of course, then as an investment firm, uh, number four, which is very important, is what's the deal dynamic? So can you make money on it? It's a really nice segue. You mentioned founders and amazing founders. I'd love to call out, I believe, Anshuman is with us today. Anshuman, did you want to say anything while we're in this chat? I'm happy to do the closing remarks, Greg, but uh, whenever we get to that. Okay, we are we probably have time for one other question then. Um, let me just pick. I mean, who better than Anshuman and Kamal to actually absolutely personify that great phenomenal founder uh yes so fantastic um Paresh asks a question beyond agriculture and evs in india you see an upcoming theme in climate tech which is catching interest and could have a global pull and they put in quotations built in india for the world is there anything you see coming out of india in that way actually a lot of stuff we see 
is built in India for the world. So Iki is built in India for the world. Um, there are two investments that we haven't yet announced, but they are building the software layer, the operating system layer for charging and uh, creating interoperability across charging infrastructure. Uh, we're looking very closely at companies that are building out sort of SaaS platforms or computational platforms for scope three measurement. You know, 60% of the world's scope three sits in Asia because so much manufacturing sits there. So if you can solve for scope three there, then it is uh, relevant across the world. Um, we're also seeing some big data models emerge that can be useful globally. And a uh, lot of new battery chemistry is being experimented here, uh, as I'm sure it is elsewhere in the world as well. Recycling, waste management, uh, sub plastic substitutes for packaging, so lots of new technology, very exciting stuff that's happening here that's built in India for the world. Awesome. Now, Riddhi is there, so I'll see what I've missed and I'm sure Riddhi will complete it far better. Um, there's a question from Anj again. What is the best way to measure progress of climate startups avoiding fraud and corruption, spe especially helping Mangrove and other carbon <laughs> removal companies? See, that's one, one of the things I uh, forgot to mention is uh, carbon removal and carbon measurement, carbon markets. So India has rolled out something called the Green Credit Program. So there is carbon credit, which only looks at carbon, but there are green credit programs that the government is rolling out. So we shall see how it unfolds. It's very new. Um, and whoever asked the question, I have a, a question back for you why single out climate companies for fraud and corruption i think it goes back to if uh, companies and people are working with good intent and integrity then they will not be fraud and corruption otherwise you will find it in financial services in e-commerce and everything uh, great question there um i think anshman it's time now we are almost at the hour and want to respect everyone's time so i'm going to pass it over to you thank you greg and uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending this keynote. I hope uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did. Anjali, thank you so much. Uh, Anjali Andruti. Um, what I wanted to say was uh, that uh, Anjali is not just uh, an investor in the company. She is a friend and she's almost like a bit of a co-founder in the company because we've been battling ideas uh, uh, before even Terra started and definitely every single stage after that. And I wanted to call out uh, one special thing, which is really close to Kamal and me and Mayank, which is uh, we have these three principles about uh, the way we run Terra. Uh, and I think Anjali exemplifies all of that for us. So number one is to not die as a company. Uh, and as an investor, uh, Anjali has made sure that that doesn't happen. Because if you die, then all of these cute ideas go by the wayside. It doesn't matter. Uh, but number two is uh, something that Anjali has brought us back again and again to which is make sure you build something that matches the scale of the crisis. And it's very easy as you, especially as a founder, you go into this rabbit hole where you start kind of really digging deep into one specific area that may or may not uh, uh, be uh, matching how big the, the, the scale of the problem is. It might build a reasonable revenue line or a business line for you. And Anjali has brought us back to the scale and the scope of the crisis over and over again. So I thank you, Anjali, for 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 keeping us honest there and the third thing which is um, also exemplified in this group here is uh, to build it the right way so often again as founders you uh, when you're really deep down in the trenches it's hard to figure out uh, what your true superpowers are and what's kind of just incidental uh, and contextual and Anjali has again brought us back to the fact that the fact that we can build a community like this all of you here uh, who then go on to do incredible things and have this multiplicative power uh, is something that Anjali has reminded us of over and over again. So again, Anjali, thank you for being a friend uh, of Terra, of the company, uh, of, for, for all of us. And frankly, for uh, being a pioneer in this incredibly difficult but extremely important uh, space, which is trying to get India to be at the forefront, leading the green the, uh, the, the next green revolution, so to speak. And uh, I thank you for being here and hopefully we'll get to see more of you during our multiple different programs and, and connections. Back to you, thank Greg. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Greg, Kamal, Anshuman, and all of you. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to partner with Terra and to be part of this amazing journey and to all of you for your passion and commitment to solving for climate. Yes, thanks, Anjali. Thanks, everyone. We are at time. I want to respect your time, but thank you all for joining. Thanks for this amazing presentation. And uh, Anjali and, and Ridi, I, I'm going to ask if you could share the slides with me. Fellows are asking if they could get a copy of the slides, please. We'll send you some of them. We'll pull out a few. Uh, this is kind of the Alana presentation, so we'll send you a few of them. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Thanks, all. See you soon. Thank you. I appreciate you all being here. Thank you. And Anjali, I'm seeing many um, positive comments. I mean, very happy comments in the chat as well. Just really appreciating you and this talk. So thank you so much. Listen, it's collective responsibility. It's collective action. But each one of, of us has to act individually to make collective action happen. 100%. So everyone have a great day. Cool. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.